of the 10-man breakaway, then you've read the move today. It was a hard one to get into because of the vicious cycling that went on for the first two hours of the day. But once the elastic snapped, 10 riders now have 10 minutes over the field, and that's enough for them to win today. 50 kilometers to go, they won't get caught, but uh, with 10 riders, it's going to make for a very interesting final few kilometers because not all of those riders up there can sprint. So there will be a lot of attacks coming as we get nearer to the finish in Nîmes. There's no little springboards along the way today. Fairly flat road. Winds will continue to blow. But our lovely, warm, red-hot, sunny conditions, uh, the sunny bit you can take out now is still warm to red-hot, uh, but the clouds are coming over. I don't think it'll rain in the next hour anyway, so that's all they need. This is the breakaway. Igor Gonzalez to Galliano driving through, doing his little turn at the front, then moving across to make, make room for the next workhorse on the team. This is Mongin. And then comes the Gerolsteiner rider here, Peter Rolich. He's a strong man, that man from Germany. He can sprint and he can ride well on the flat. Mark Lotz is a very shrewd rider. And I notice he's picked to ride alongside Rolich. Now, the Dutch can always speak German, so they will have a good conversation. And this is Aitor Gonzalez. We saw him once uh, on OLN win the Tour of Spain and on that occasion win three stages as well. But he's not a very good sprinter. It's about the only thing he can't do, actually. Meanwhile, back in the main field, they're preoccupied here. Michael Bogart, always uh, used to be a challenger in the Tour de France, has become pretty anonymous this time around. He's been having his first share of crashes, certainly, and now it looks like he's been seconded to become the water carrier for the Rabobank team today. Still, he won't be too disappointed because he's got his teammate Mark Lotz in the leading group. As the field now it looks as though it may actually be beginning to start to chase here. That's well, a long, thin line, Paul. Maybe they've decided to lift the pace. Maybe 10 minutes has been a bit too much for them. Just a little bit too much. I think more than anything else, they're uh, racing to get to the finish, to get this stage over and done with. They don't want to see that time gap uh, leap up to sizes of around about the 20-minute mark. So I think what they'll do is they'll just... Uh, have a, a turning round of teams on the front lifting up the pace. They don't think we'll pick up the pace enough to pull them all back into the main field, but it's really just a question of uh, getting the suffering over for one more day. And, of course, at the start of the day, the man in yellow after a brilliant battle in the Pyrenees is Thomas Vokler. He still has 22 seconds left of the nine and a half he went into the mountains with, nine minutes and a half he went into the mountains with over Armstrong, who is now in second. Basso has come up with a first and second place in the mountains to third place and Cloden had a brilliant uh, sorte himself in the mountains uh, uh, he is now into fourth place there shouldn't be any changes in the overall today we didn't expect any and uh, there's not going to be any now because all of the small time bonus getters are right here in this leading group and uh, they're just working regularly now the gap still goes up it's 10 minutes 25 as I speak don't forget, it's a rest day tomorrow. There will, of course, be a program for you. And if you've missed any of the Tour de France's most exciting moments thus far this year, then tune in to the rest day recap show. It'll come to you tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific timings as the Tour de France on its day of rest, a total recap for you on OLN. Now, again, they queue up to go round, our brave policemen, and no problems as they continue with just 30 miles left here. Still nobody in any hurry. Bernard Eisel is the, is the Austrian sprinter there, 165. He sat at the back an awful long way today. He's clearly uh, suffering from an injury, and we believe it to be a big boil on the you-know-where, because he's sitting off his saddle right now, and that is the most painful place to get a boil if you're an international cyclist. Uh, it certainly is, and uh, you don't want that to happen at all and on a number of occasions. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember uh, Frankie Andrea when he rode the Tour de France a couple of years ago, and he rode the Tour de France, I think, on nine occasions and finished every one of them. He actually finished the Tour de France over the last four stages, and he cut a huge hole in his saddle just so he could get himself to the finish. And that's uh, very often because of the fact of, of the, the riders in this very predominant hot part of the southern part of France and it really starts to irritate that rather tender area of the body.
Well, the big problem is, of course, that you've got to make sure your shorts are clean because when you're racing in the rain, the dirt goes into the shorts, it rubs into the skin, and it causes the problem. But the riders usually put a form of chamois cream onto their shorts. The shorts have an insert, which is a beautiful piece of soft chamois leather. It's very comfortable to ride, I might add, uh, but if things go a bit wrong, then it's not so comfortable after that. It certainly isn't. Uh the, the best part, the best kind of chamois cream has to be made from a, a basis of uh, lanolin, a very pure cream, to uh, make sure that that area is nice and clean and it's also well protected. The leaders, uh, ten and a half minutes to the good over the group containing the Maillot Jaune, the Maillot Vert, the Maillot Poir Rouge and the Maillot Blanc and Lance Armstrong, the Maillot Bleu, for the moment at least. As they all ride along, the gap continues to grow and we are running out of miles, 47 kilometres in fact, is all that now remains for these riders. Very soon, the front group of 10 are going to have to make some internal decisions as to who can get away from each other. You can probably see now that the crowds on the top of the crowd are uh, getting a little bit overcast at the moment as the riders continue towards the finish in Nima. Let me just remind you about uh, the Trek Bike Sweepstakes. Uh, this is proving very popular. Enter Trek's Ride with Lance giveaway. Go to trekbikes.com and there you will find your participating dealer. As we look now back at the peloton here, this is a rider who slipped down just to check things out. And uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Nicolas Jalabert here, so he still senses he's not going to be attacked. He was the man that caused the breakaway. He's gone back to stock up for food. If for the next 25 kilometers he can continue to take drinks after that, the cars have to stay behind and the riders get on with the job in hand. Santiago Botero, I have my suspicions he might try to go today. Three stage wins in his life, just take a good look at that. He looks pretty cool right now. He might be the man for the stage. Well, you can only be wrong at least nine times. We'll take a break. Rejoin us live on OLN. Welcome back. There is the beautiful Cathedral Saint-Pierre. And uh, standing out right in the middle of this beautiful old Roman settlement. It's now a bustling town, of course. We're heading to Nîmes today. The Tour de France has turned off the pressure for the first time since we left Liège in Belgium. The long straight roads, these are the leaders, ten of them just rejoining, having been back for a cup of tea, is Aitor Gonzalez. We still have ten leaders, none of them is in, are in trouble at the moment, and the gap is now approaching 11 minutes for these boys. No way will they be caught now as they go into the last 44 kilometres of the day. Massive crowds here as they course down the side of the country. This is the west side of France now having left the southern mountains yesterday. There's the whole field down there. And I think this is the first time that we've seen the Tour de France and the riders, Paul, actually enjoy their day in the saddle. This is the team of the race leader, Thomas Voigtler. On occasion, we see them smiling, no pressure. Those 10 leaders are now exactly 11 minutes ahead. So we can start deciding who might make the next attack from there because these boys won't see them till the showers. Well, I think this is a convenient day for everybody in the Tour de France. We've had a very difficult opening 10 days on the flat and then two very hard days in the Pyrenees. So it's not surprising to see the majority of riders taking a back seat. But it's not been like this all for the, all for the whole stage after all, Phil. We had a very fast two hours of racing. And in fact, it took two hours of racing until the right combination of the breakaway was formed. And once that breakaway of 10 men formed at the front of the group, the gap just went boom right up to over 10 minutes. I have to say, I smiled to myself there, Paul, with that giant hand that almost knocked off uh, Giuseppe Garini there. Because as we all remember, he was the man that got knocked approaching the finish should outdo it by Eric the photographer. Eric did apologize. Garini got back on and won the stage. Yeah, that was rather uh, <laughs> a very, uh, very fortunate situation for Garini. He had enough advantage to get back onto the bike and get up to the finish line and win at the summit of the great mountain that this year we will ride as an individual time trial that was back in 1999 when that happened and uh, fortunately for him he'll be going back to the tour de france again this year and hopefully uh, there won't be anybody uh, leap out in front of him so well, that, that was back in 1999 at alp duez and this time it was almost a giant green hand that felled him i think he has to keep away from the public doesn't he? i think he needs to just ride on his own but um, 
You know, that's the amazing thing about the public this afternoon. They've turned out in huge force. I was a little worried yesterday on a number of occasions going up some of those mountains. There were so many people on that last climb of the day, Phil. I was a bit worried for the riders' safety on occasions. Well, it is a concern of the organization, but you know, it would be a great shame if everybody was always behind barriers. The great thing about the Tour de France is there's never any vandalism. Uh, there are great uh, public who cheer the riders on. It would be a shame to separate them too far away from this wonderful event. Uh, but they'll certainly do it in the time trial to Alpe d'Huez because time is of the essence. And we should get there with about 160 riders of the 188 who started. But you know, of the 21 teams now, only four of them are carrying all of the starters. We'll see what happens. Sadly, some of the big names have already gone. Uh, team leaders who have gone, Tyler Hamilton of Phonak, Alessandro Pataki of Fassa Bortolo. Um, let me see now, Bradley McGee of FDJ.com, ages ago, Mario Cipollini. These were team leaders, Magnus Bagstead, the team leader of Alessio. All of those boys carried one on the numbers, are now out of the Tour de France. And of the leaders still in the Tour de France, a couple of them have taken a serious pasting over the last 48 hours. Number 31, Iban Mayo, more than 37 minutes behind Lance Armstrong in the overall classification. A man we thought could possibly win this year. And of course, maybe the most famous wearer of a number one for his team, number 11, Jan Ulrich, losing himself six and a half minutes in two days of racing. Well, if you'd have asked me to put a bet on him doing that, I would never have gone near it because I wouldn't have thought it possible, but he's had two thoroughly forgettable days in the Pyrenees. Lance Armstrong has always remarked that that man Ulrich rides so much better in the final week of the Tour de France, as indeed he does. Well, let's see if he can pull himself back up at least to a podium place. It's impossible, I will say. Uh, he can't pull himself back up now to, to the side of Lance Armstrong, as he has almost done uh, on three occasions in the past. 11 minutes 20 now the gap. Well, that's good enough for the day. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, the man behind the new man on the block is Ivan Vasso, and the man who looks after him is the winner of the 96th Tour de France. His name is Bjorn Arise. Frankie Andreo spoke to him earlier. Bjorn, Ivan Vasso has been the only rider been able to stay with Lance Armstrong. A lot of people say that he's a little bit weaker in the time trials, but you've made some efforts to improve his time trialing. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, we passed a lot of tests uh, to improve, and, uh, <clears throat> and his position right now is it's very good. So I think he, he, he can gain a lot. And then, well, I think after, after that, it comes to good condition, and then uh, good motivation. Basso, obviously he has good condition. What are your hopes for him for the uphill Alpe West time trial? I hope he can stay close to Armstrong and uh, maybe not beat him but uh, make a good effort and and and, and try to, to make Lance off of it well I can tell you now that Ivan Basso has won a time trial in the past it was in a race in Italy in the year 2000 but it wasn't a very big race I wonder if he can take Lance Armstrong on in the Alps we'll find out of course this coming week it's going to be a great final week of the tour just seeing here at the front, Nicolas Jalabert now taking up the running. Mark Lotz, these are the ten leaders, followed by Santiago Batero here. This is a great moving breakaway now. And they're enjoying the moment. The split in the peloton, but it's not a serious split. We're just using all of the road as we head towards Nîmes today. And there is no change in the leaderboard. 11 and a half minutes we are heading up to now, and the breakaway is clearly going frontwards. Well, we heard John Arise there, and it is a wonderful week of racing we've got previewed in the Alps. I wonder if Ivan Basso can. Before we go back to the action, let's just have a look at the routes they face. Not for the nervous, by the way, if you want to look away as we head now into the Alps. We have a rest day tomorrow, then we come up with a, a ride to one of my favourite areas, the Vecor. This is Villa de Lens. It looks steep, it is steep, and yet we don't talk about it often as the big part of the Alps. They're only second category climbs, but they are seriously hard, and it's in this area very often the Tour de France takes on a different face. Beautiful, beautiful zone. This area is covered in wildflowers and butterflies, for which it is famous. Uh, but for us, it is a profile that counts. This is the coach de Chalimont. 
taking the riders up to 1,374 metres, and that's a tough finish for any day. Then the next day, it's back down to the valley and the beautiful valley of Bourg d'Oison, the valley of the Doison. And this is where we find the famed and the fabled Alpe d'Huez. It's 21 bends, goes out of the valley. We can expect on these slopes a million spectators on Wednesday. The police are concerned, everybody's concerned. The last five kilometers will be barriered. So the riders, every second don't forget, will count. And Lance Armstrong will be looking at that stage to be starting as the last man and the yellow jersey of the tour. Basso will probably be just in front of him. Remember that back in the year 2001, the great Lance Armstrong launched an attack after that famous look at uh, Jan Ulrich. He went to the victory and, of course, the tour win. Ooh, I was getting quite excited there, thinking about what is to come over the next week in the Alps. Meanwhile, back in the camp here and back to the team cars, we've got Christophe Moreau, who's having a great tour. Things aren't going so well for him always, but he is riding a great tour, and he's looking very, very relaxed there, chatting with Roger Leger, the manager on the credit. Would you like a Coca-Cola? No. All right, then as we look at yellow, we'll take a break and stay live on OLM. So, as we're looking at Aitor Gonzalez, spearhead what is certainly the winning break of the day. Lance Armstrong and everybody else down in that main field are going to feel rather happy now that that break has gone. Nobody affects the overall lead. Igor Martinez is best placed, 37 minutes back. He's in 43rd place with his time gains right now. He's up to 23rd, and he still is nowhere near the men that matter in this year's Tour de France. It's the sort of day, quite frankly, we expected, and for that reason, we were rather amazed to see how quick this race went for the first two hours. But now the breakaway is gone. This is the man that took a rather direct visit down to a ditch uh, soon after the feeding zone. We did show you the pictures of the crash there. This is Jean-Patrick Nazon. Already a stage winner here in Wascal and a stage winner last year in Paris and the yellow jersey wearer for a day in for, for France last year as well. Nasty fall, silly fall of course, just got the little feeding bag entangled in the front wheel and down the ditch he went. But it was a soft landing, not like poor old Marco Velo about ten days ago who landed on a glass bottle in the ditch and of course was out of the race. Well, I have to say that is a magnificent picture. It is a long uh, roundabout, the riders there going round on both sides as usual. Now, don't forget, tomorrow is a rest day in the riders' days, but for us it isn't. We will bring you a total recap of the Tour de France so far, all of the exciting moments. We've had plenty of those, and it will come to you at a special time at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Our rest day Tour de France recap, tomorrow here on OLM. Well, the wooded country around the Roman settlements, and we're heading now towards the finish. 35 kilometers to go. What a lovely picture that is of the main peloton, but uh, they don't appear to be going very fast, and that's because they're not now. The gap is up to 12 minutes, 12 seconds, still going up at a crucial stage of the day, just 35 kilometers, or about 22 miles uh, from the finish. And the winners are gone for the day. And it was all due to the persistence by young Nicolas Jalabert, the rider who is on the, was on the CSC team, is now on Phonak. Uh, sadly, it was Phonak who lost Tyler Hamilton yesterday, their team leader. He retired from the Tour de France, and now they're looking for a compensatory stage win. Jalabert clearly determined today, Paul, and I think we're going to see him make a move. Well, he's been in the situation of almost getting stage wins in the Tour de France before. He would certainly try, like to try and emulate the uh, pedigree of his brother. His brother, Laurent Jalabert, won a number of stages in the Tour de France, including in one year, two, and especially probably dear to his heart, one on the 14th of July. And that was on the roads down into Colmar. And strangely enough, that day into Colmar, when Laurent Jalabert won himself his stage on the 14th of July, one man went down and broke his collarbone. His name was Ivan Basso. And he got up and finished the stage but wasn't able to start the next day, and who would... Who Whatever would happened to Ivan Basso? I think he's quite high up in the overall classification now. He suddenly came back to life in the Pyrenees. He got a first and a second, and he's now lying in third place overall in this race. It is amazing how fortunes do change, not just on an annual basis in international cycling, but, of course, on a daily basis if you ride in the Tour de France. The body accepts some days better than others, and I think probably we should ask Jan Ulrich for more details on that. 
This is the group at the front at 12 minutes and 13 seconds. It's very, very unusual to see a breakaway at this stage of the Tour de France uh, going still away from the peloton. Nobody really too interested in them. The best man up there is indeed uh, Martinez. 37 minutes is the gap. Meanwhile, back in the field, we are looking at the red jerseys there of uh, Brioche La Boulanger. Well, the race today has come away, of course, from the Pyrenees, which are now behind us. There's a beautiful aqueduct as well, uh, or viaduct rather, as the riders now are heading up towards the blue waters of the Mediterranean and onwards to Nîmes. And it is here where the race will spend a rest day, by the way, and then continue on its way on Tuesday. And what a final week. It is going to be an incredible final week. One of the toughest sessions we've had on the Tour de France, many say for more than 30 years, gradually finishing up on the famed Champs-Élysées a week today. It's going to be a horrendous final week. Uh, the riders will, I think, uh, try and enjoy as much as they can the rest day in Nîmes tomorrow. But unfortunately, it's not a rest off the bike. They will have to ride, and probably because there's a mountain stage the day after it, they will have to ride between two and three hours just to make sure that the bodies don't completely and utterly turn off. But it will be a day for the possibility of recovery for a lot of riders, like Iban Meyer, who lost 37 minutes in two days and also the possibility for riders like Bobby Julik, who was injured in a rather nasty fall yesterday on one of the Pyrenean descents. Quick rundown, if you're just joining us on the breakaway, Santiago Botero of T-Mobile, Nicolas Jalabert, Fonac, Inigo Ladeluza and Igor Martinez of Uscatel, Aito Gonzalez, another Spanish rider, Fasa Bortolo, uh, Pierrick Federigo, Credi Agricole, Peter Rollick, Gerald Steiner, Igor Gonzalez de Galliano from uh, the, the Liberty Seguros team, Rabobank's Mark Locks and FDJ.com Christophe Monjon. They were the one that finally found the legs to get away from the pack after about an hour and a half of incredible attacking riding. Fortunately, unfortunately, before we came live onto television, but now this group is clear. Twelve and a quarter minutes. I wonder if that will be the limit for the day. It doesn't look like it's going to be as we get a little bit of picture breakup as we uh, make our way through these trees, the Platan trees, which border very many of these avenues in the south of France. This gives the men who've uh, raced very hard over the last 48 hours for overall glory in the Tour de France the chance to rest and recuperate before they go up to the final phase, which is going to be quite horrendous as we go into the mountains of the Alps for three very difficult stages. Two of them road stages, and for the first time ever, an individual mountain top time trial to the summit of the Alpe d'Huez. Armstrong, I think, will be hoping to open up the gap over everybody else, but I'm sure in the back of his mind he's going to take note of the man who's not he's not been able to get rid of on the two Pyrenean stages, Ivan Basso. Basso, since he first participated in the Tour de France in 2001, has consistently Im improved. He didn't finish his first tour because he fractured his collarbone, but in his second race he finished 11th. Then he came back last year and finished 7th, and was uh, a rider promising to ride well in the overall classification and this year he's right up at the top of the overall race and I see him as being the real serious challenger for Armstrong superiority. It's nice to see a new name come on the block. Uh, it's an interesting day today because the last two days have been viciously hard. There's been a total shuffling up of the overall classification except that we still have the same leader albeit no longer by nine minutes over Armstrong but by just 22 seconds with Thomas Volkler and because of that shaking up now Riders who are a long way behind overall and with teams who have lost contenders for the overall like Fonak with Tyler Hamilton and then they've gone out on the attack to try and steal at least uh, the big prize for the stage winner. The best placed in the breakaway is 37 minutes behind and that is, there he is, Igor Martinez. So as they now stock up as we run towards the last 30 kilometers of today's stage Bet your life, this bunch will not go down to the line together. We will take a break. Welcome back as the lead continues to accelerate despite the fact we are now just 28 kilometers from the finish of the 192 which comprised today's stage of the Tour de France. These 10 men are getting themselves together about 97 kilometers from the finishing line today in Nîmes. Everywhere we go there is a massive crowd here cheering the riders through and they've continued to build a lead over the peloton. No concern amongst the leaders back in the main field. All of their gains came yesterday in the mountains. Today, they're trying to rest before we uh, continue our assault in the Alps, which, by the way, is not tomorrow, because we have a rest day tomorrow in Nîmes. 
and our blue jersey still on the shoulders down there of Lance Armstrong. The gap at the moment, though, between Armstrong and the rest of the peloton is 12 minutes and 38 seconds. Nobody is concerned back there. Well, there are two riders on the same team here, and uh, I think it's nearly impossible to work out a combination as to which way this breakaway will go. You see from the flag there how strong the wind is coming. Same direction all day because the, the uh, uh, sea is on the right. It's blowing in off the sea, the blue waters of the Mediterranean. But the crowds here, Paul, are enormous now. Incredible the crowds that have turned out, but I think the crowds on the slopes of the climb up to the finish yesterday, the Plateau de Bay, all came here this afternoon because it took us an awful long time to get down to the finishing line and an awful long time to get off the mountain last night. This is turning out to be a very popular Tour de France, and I think because of the fact that they've got a very popular young French race leader in the form of Thomas Vaucler. He's not really going to get challenged this afternoon because this is an ideal situation for him. It's also an ideal situation for all the other main contenders. After 48 hours of seriously intense battle in the Pyrenees, they can take backstage for a while before we go up into the Alpine passes. But one man from this leading group of 10 riders has the chance of a lifetime, the chance to win a stage of the Tour de France. Santiago Botero there in the pink jersey, he's done it three times before. But the other guys in the group, apart from Christophe Mongin, who's won one, have never actually been onto the podium at the Tour. An interesting breakaway. The right combination. This is the town now of Vivier, which takes it into the last 26 kilometres. There is a time bonus sprint here. Nobody's interested in six seconds. Right now they've got 12 and a half minutes, and that isn't even helping. Uh, but there are small prizes as well. I don't think they'll hotly contest it, because they might be giving away some of their sprinting ability. They're all far more interested now as to who will take out the stage at the finish, which is only 26 kilometres away, just over 16 miles from the finish. And it looks as though the organisers have put this on a little climb as we climb away from the village here. UVL, a massive crowd right through town, and they've continued right out on the highway. That'll be the 500 metres to go board that we're approaching. Nobody getting itchy feet at the moment. If somebody does accelerate and try and get themselves the time bonus and more importantly the cash prize on the finishing line, you can be certain that this is a good point for a counter move by one of the riders who's got the ability to ride alone to the finish. I would put three riders down with the ability to ride for the last uh, few kilometers alone. Aito Gonzalez, Igor Gonzalez de Galliano and Santiago Botero. All very good time trialists. And all speaking the same language even if one of them isn't from Spain. That'll be a subway trivia question for you one day as to which one. Looking down now at the peloton as they continue towards the finish, and uh, we've got 26 kilometres to go. From our helicopter here, right over the top of the leading breakaway, there are about 200 metres, if that, from the sprint line here at Vivriel, and there's, no, there's going to be nobody go for this sprint. They're purely concentrating on the finish, it is going to be Gerald Steiner's 100 metres. This is the fastest sprint I've ever commentated on. 100 metres now as over the top goes Peter Rollick. Uh, he, I don't think they want to give away just who has got the great legs now after this long breakaway because they know that very soon they're going to have to declare the colours. Rollick going over ahead of Mongin there and in third place will be uh, Federigo, the third uh, the man from Credit Agricole. Christophe Mongin being very attentive there. You can see this is a huge crowd that has turned out here this afternoon. It's a wonderful Sunday afternoon in France. It's coming up to 4.30 in the afternoon. And in around about half an hour, we should know just exactly who's going to run out as the overall winner. Christophe Mongin on the front there from uh, Francis de Jure has got a very good turn of speed. In fact, uh, in his first participation in the Tour de France, I think back in 1999, he actually led a large group of around about 25 riders to the line and got himself a stage victory on that occasion. Well, there we have the Texas flag on the right as uh, they'll have to wait, in fact, uh, 12 and a half minutes before they see the man that comes from Texas, Lance Armstrong himself. Let's call on the running man. Here he comes. For exclusive race highlights, behind the scenes action, AOL for broadband members. Off you go to AOL keyword Tour de France or AOL.com. And it's more getting close now to be the last visit to the team cars for drinks and uh, advice as to how to handle uh, 10 men in a breakaway, 25 kilometers from the finish now. And just holding his hand up there, the man that started the move, Nicolas Jalabert. Can he finish it off? There's the big question. Stay live with us here on OLM. 
Welcome back, and we're with the leaders here now on the road with just 23 kilometers left to pedal at Santiago Botero. Great time trial rider. Would like to be rid of these other nine riders with him, though, if he's looking for a fourth ever stage win in the Tour de France. Inside 15 miles from the end, the Igor Gonzalez de Galdeon is the rider in blue. They're just uh, relieving him at the front there, Eitor Gonzalez, the other top Spanish time trialist. And uh, this is now, they're still all working. No passengers, no ticket collectors at the back of this group at all. And so the riders there working well together. Two riders from the same team, the Yonis Jersey of Huskudel Uskadi. A little bit surprised. They were the ones expected to excel in the Pyrenees for the last two days. Now, don't forget, today's word of the day is breakaway. And log on to OLNTV.com and find out more. You can enter for a chance to win a great trip cycling through France in OLN's Tour de France sweepstakes. The word of the day, breakaway. And that's just what we're looking at right now. This is a breakaway, and it's about the biggest breakaway we've had at this stage of the race, except at the mountains, of course. 13 minutes and 7 seconds, the biggest margin so far. Still gaining as we get nearer the finish. Well, it just shows you the lack of interest in that back punch, Paul, as we've gone up to our biggest uh, advantage now, 13.07, over the main field. I want to remember Brian Robinson, who was the first British cyclist to win a stage of the Tour de France in 1959. Charles Sasson, I think it was. He won by 20 minutes and a hatful of seconds. Attempts on a number of occasions uh, throughout the history of the Tour de France. I remember when I was racing, there was a guy by the name of Fons de Wolf. He actually won a stage in this part of France on the way to the Ville de Rouer by 22 minutes. He moved up to fourth place in the overall classification and he turned around and lost 30 the next day, but he won the stage. That's all that matters uh, to many cyclists. Uh, there are those who ride to win stages. There are very few who can ride with the ability to win the Tour de France. This is the breakaway. Still looking as though they're not thinking about how to get rid of each other just yet. Don't you believe it? And riding straight at camera now, the first of this 10-man breakaway, Igor Gonzalez de Galeano. He moves across, up comes the other Spanish rider, Aitor Gonzalez. Meanwhile, down the road, some 13 minutes and 23 seconds, is the preambling bunch here of the Tour de France. Nobody interested, 150 riders in this group. Will be treated to a sprint royale, that's for sure, but right now they're only thinking of taking 11th place today. But it will be a great sprint because the battle for that green sprinter's points jersey is very much at stake. Separating Robbie McEwen in green to Eric Zarbel is a mere nine points. And that nine points will be the last time for a couple of days that Eric Zarbel will have a chance to reduce the distance between himself and the Australian leader of that, of that competition because I don't think there are that many positions in the race available for them. They'll have their very long stage on Friday before the individual time trial after the mountains to try and get themselves a few more. And then, of course, it could very well once again all go down to the final day on the Champs-Élysées, as it did last year and the year before. That's right. Last year, um, Jean-Patrick Nazon won for France and Baden Cook took home the green jersey as the second Australian to win it. The previous year, it was the first Australian, Robbie McEwen. Pretty fine motor there in the middle. That's a Peugeot 203, and that's a replica of one of the early Tour de France uh, support vehicles. This looks a uh, pretty solid machine. Good job the riders rode old bikes as well, otherwise it might not have kept up with the field. It wouldn't today, that's for sure. Santiago Butero there. They're on the left of the picture, by the way. This massive crowd completely has blotted out what is quite a roundabout here. But the riders, as always, safely guided through. And this is Peter Rolich of uh, Gerald Steiner. Aitor Gonzalez, the ride in the white. I feel Aitor Gonzalez has got to go at some stage if he's got any ambition of winning today. He can't sprint uh, as well as some of these riders. And that is uh, Federigo in the green and white now coming through. He's being trailed by Lando Luze of the Uskadel team. That must be the 20 kilometers to go banner coming up now. Now that might start to send uh, a little bit of warning through those veins. Well, if you're a good time trialist like Santiago Botero, Aitor Gonzalez, or even Igor Gonzalez de Galeano, it's still a good time to try and surprise the rest. Those are the kind of guys that if they can get 100 or 150 meters advantage over a group, could hold it all the way down to the line. But the other seven riders in that group, they know that. They will be waiting for the move to come from a long way out. They will be attentive, 
and the team that needs to be the most attentive is the team that's got two riders in that group the two riders from Uskatel Uskadi have got the most to lose Igor Inigo Landaluz and Egoi Martinez I think have to do the work together as a solid block to try and make sure it doesn't split up towards the end well Peter Rollick who we've seen quite frequently up there he's only won uh, five six races he had one win this year in Germany which is his home town home nation of course uh, but people in Australia might remember him because he won the Sun Tour back there in the 2001 the Herald Sun Tour by the way Paul is a major race in Australia it's run off in November and a lot of these riders uh, as they get into their off season go to race down in Australia where they also carry on of course and they stay on the beaches for the winter for what is their winter and the Australian summer 1336 now is a huge gap and uh, inside 20 kilometers to go most unusual it is still going up still continuing to increase as you can see at the back end of the main field uh, certainly not a great lot of interest in trying to get uh, a victory this afternoon Uskatel Uskadi Phil were the team looking for a stage victory in the mountains over the last two days they certainly now are in an ideal position to get a stage victory on the flat a lot of teams uh, this year are still looking to try and get themselves a victory in the Tour de France. So the team that has done uh, the best so far is US Postal with two wins, as has Fasa Bortolo. AG2R, Lotto, Domo, Cofidis, Quickstep are teams that have two wins to their credit. Credit Agricole has one, CSC has one, but there's still a lot of teams out there with nothing to show from this Tour de France. 13 to be precise because uh, 13 teams have not provided a stage winner on the squad they've had a lot of camera time many of them uh, but you know riders often say if they don't ride well in the Tour de France their sponsors are most unhappy even though they probably ride a hundred other races in the year it is the Tour de France which grabs them the biggest slice of publicity so they always want to ride well here and that's why we've got 10 riders clear now by nearly 14 minutes there's Botero over to our left, followed by Gonzalez. I must say the Spanish are working well in this breakaway. We better watch out for Mark Blotz. He's a Dutch. We'll take another break, come back and rejoin us. Welcome back, and uh, the artists have been at work again. The field may have been at Reaped, but the pavement artists down there are absolutely wonderful. The passage of the Tour de France now racing through the department of the Gare. As they head towards Nîmes, massive, massive crowds today. They're big every day, but they're looking quite big to say the least today. They're just running into the last 16 kilometers to go now. That's 10 miles for the leading 10 riders. Well, he really worked so hard, Thomas Voigtler, yesterday to keep that Mayo Jean. He kept it only by 22 seconds. The image of him punching the sky when he knew he kept the lead will stay with us forever. But today he deserves this sort of a day so he can at least enjoy it. We fear it will be his last day in the yellow paw. It's a rest day tomorrow. It's still his, as it was on the rest day last week. Uh, but then when the race restarts on Tuesday, I think Lance Armstrong will turn the screw that little bit tighter. And from then on, it's who can catch him. There's seven big climbs on the last uh, part of the stage as the race goes from Val Valerias to Vidal de Lens. And that is going to be a very difficult day for everybody 180 kilometers and that uh, is always very strange how the body reacts phil after you've had a rest day and a lot of these riders will realize that but as far as this young man who leads the bike race uh, thomas vukla is concerned he is enjoying his day over this flat part of the southern area of france here in yellow once again and the crowd i think have turned out in style to really support their star well there's the helicopter that follows these riders everywhere and with the camera mounted underneath it these days the cameraman sits inside just twisting levers but what great images they do bring us and uh, this is the breakaway now driving on Christophe Magin is the rider in white he can pack a punch at the finish and might be a big danger if they don't get rid of him there is Peter Rollick going through he's 30 years of age now had his 30th birthday last uh, May and coming up behind now absolutely regular riding this they do what they call a uh, through and off and it's quite a simple description isn't it you just keep the pace going by a little bit of pace making then slip down you allow the wind to push you steadily to the back then you race up in the slipstream of the other rider as we look at the breakaway uh, we can't we must never refer to them i suppose as no hopers but they are in the context of the race for the race lead the yellow jersey the battle was run yesterday 
and uh, wasn't absolutely won by Lance Armstrong, but he's done enough now to move into second place, 22 seconds off the race leader, Thomas Voiklip. This is uh, something of a pre-rest day now, after those two magnificent days in the Pyrenees by the strong men of the Tour de France. The nearest man uh, to the yellow jersey in that breakaway is Martinez of Spain, 37 minutes behind. Uh, seven of those riders are more than one hour. They're not going to affect the overall race. Armstrong, Ulrich, Ivan Basso, they're all in this group here with the yellow jersey. But they still have to be attentive, even though they're cruising along more than 13 minutes behind this leading group of 10 riders. They have to be careful. There could be a split at any time. There could be a crash at any time. And it's very often on days like this, when the main field is relaxed, that you do see accidents happening in the main field and if you just heard that little applause just coming up out from the crowd just on the far side away from our commentary position that was because a former five-time winner of the Tour de France has just got out of a car in front of us that's Bernardino yes now part of the organization and uh, still a very popular person in France of course Nicolas Jalaba he's the man that started it and I wonder if he can finish it today there was clearly a lot of riders intent on getting away from that pack was not an easy thing to do it looks great and easy now they've got 13 minutes but the time this break went there were a number of combinations came they were chased down it was a magnificent two hours of racing and then all of a sudden it was on i suppose the unlucky rider is Stuart o'grady of australia he was in every move and the one that went he was just caught moments before it went that's the look of the draw sometimes uh, very often that's the way it happens when you are so keen to get into the winning move you go with nine moves and it's the tenth one that goes and I think that's what happened to Stuart O'Grady this morning he knew today was the last opportunity for him to get in a big breakaway and try and reverse the position that he has in the green jersey competition Stuart O'Grady started the day in fourth place in that competition he would so dearly love to be the third Australian to win it but right now I think Robbie McEwen is very happy with the way the race has developed it's perfect for him it's he's still got a sprint of course as, as they all have for the green jersey points because the first 35 get them and there's only 10 here so it's going to give us a good finish on both groups one for the win and one for the points at the back all of the sprinters who want uh, that green jersey must come out to play when they get down to the finishing line these riders are only 12 kilometers from the finish but looking back 13 minutes Paul we're looking back probably a gap of eight kilometers now it's a huge gap back to the main field it really is and I'm surprised to see that not one of these riders in this leading group of ten is actually missing any turns at all it's gonna be hard to pick a winner just now right he's absolutely right 13 eight, no, 12 kilometers to go now just come up on the computer as we look at the leaders on today's stage of the Tour de France this is the peloton and they're the public and welcome back and as you rejoin us this is the first attack going off the front we've just gone under the 10 kilometers to go banner this is Igor Gonzalez de Galliano he's a man I suppose we should have picked to go alone well that's the first attack Paul Igor Gonzalez de Galliano now that will start to make everybody a little bit twitchy did you see that hand signal then he put his thumb up to say gracias that was because he was not very happy with the fact that the Spanish rider had attacked and he was nailed back by a man from his own country. But there is another Spanish move, Aitor Gonzalez. Again, a man that can't sprint, he's got to make a move. An immensely strong man, he's won the three-week Tour of Spain in the past. Crikey, I thought he was going to go straight over the central reservation there, he's through. Good place to attack, he thought perhaps he could stretch them a little bit, but they've marked him. And again, it is the Uscatel riders who are doing the marking. They clearly want to get something out of this Tour de France now, after the collapse of Iban Mayo in the Pyrenees over the last two days. Well, if there's a split, there's another there's move coming another from Perdiguero, just off the front there. Not surprising, there you can see, covered by Uscatel, Uscadi, they have the advantage of having two riders in the group. If they miss the split, the team manager won't be very happy at all. Federigo of Credit Agricole has gone now and he's being chased by Igor Martinez. They've hooked up, so that means that Landaluze, the other orange jersey, won't chase. And it looks like a reaction coming from Nicolas Jalaber now. He's trying to lead them. Well, it took Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano to make the first move, and that came at just under the 10 kilometer to go banner. 
Not a surprise. Those are the guys who are the big engines when it comes to the individual time trial. One of them, either Gonzalez de Galliano, Aitor, Gon uh, or, or, uh, Aitor Gonzalez, or Santiago Botero, had to make the move. But look at the pressure as these riders now start to really open up the gas. They've been nailed back by that. Looks a good move by Nicolas Gelabet. He's pulled them back. Aitor Gonzalez uh, has missed out on this occasion. Igor Gonzalez de Galliano has got up there in fourth place. But I think it's going to come all back together. It'll be a lot easier right now, Paul, if we're all called Smith and Jones, I think. But at the lead, at sitting at the back here now, is Aitor Gonzalez. He tried. He'll wait and recover. He'll now watch the the scurry of the riders and then hit them again. That is Christophe Manja in the white. He packs a very good sprint finish. He'll try to keep control of this and hold it together because he may have a chance of winning the stage in the sprint try and make sure he doesn't get caught out on the running towards the finish line pulling it all back together there in, in eighth position there was Santiago Botero ten men again look at this the Here we go. attack Aitor Gonzalez again. trying to get the gap and he's gone right to the other side of the road to try and break their attention because you see they've now got to launch an attack but there he goes Monjan he's the man that possesses that big power he's trying to reach Gonzalez first he knows that if you're in a situation like this, if you do not react immediately and somebody gets 50 meters, then all of a sudden people start to move around and, and they start to be tactical and they don't want to close the gap. If you get 30 or 40 meters, then it's gone. It's all going to come back together. Morgin has done a good job. Well, I'll tell you what, that Gonzalez has won the Tour of Spain. He's also won time trials in Spain and in the Tour of Italy. He's a very, very fast man. They know him very well, but he's got to go alone. Look at this now, as he settles into his rhythm. If they allow him to settle into his rhythm, he will hold the speed of 45 kilometers an hour, and they will not be able to bring him back. Well, I thought they were right on his wheel there. They were at around about 20 bicycle lengths, and it's still Christophe Mongin saying, come on, work with me. Mark Lotz realizes how dangerous it is, and he is coming by they're still trying to nail down the gap this is why it was so dangerous for one of those guys who was very good in the individual time trial to go out on the attack Aitor Gonzalez Gonzalez de Galdiano and Santiago Botero are the kind of riders who have the ability to keep this effort going for 10 kilometers look at the gap now and this is the tactical moment this is when the riders in the orange jerseys of Uscatel Uscadi need to form an alliance well, this is amazing, but you see, give this man his head and he's off and running. He's never finished the Tour de France. This is his third attempt. He's never got further than stage 10. He's always been a big disappointment in the Tour. He's been a great success in the Tours of Italy and Spain. Just checking over now. Can he just settle into his rhythm? He is thinking to himself. Aito Gonzalez, remember the Fasa Bortolo, they kicked off this tour with the win in the prologue with Cancellara. They've had two stage wins so far, and these boys are looking at each other. That's a bad sign. Well, there's two, there's two teammates in here for Uscatel, Uscadi. Now, if they want to win themselves the stage this afternoon, they really have to go to the front and try and pull back Aito Gonzalez. If you give that man 100 meters and look at it, with every pedal revolution, he's extending his advantage over the group. And that really is quite remarkable. Don't forget, you know, he has been an unbelievable stage winner in races like the Giro d'Italia, where he's won time trials. But of course, I suppose his best victory was back in 2002, when he won the Vuelta a España in a dominating style. Yes, he won three stages on that occasion. Actually, he's 30 years of age now. It's the right age to win the stage. Nice and mature. Got the stamina. Onto the outskirts of Nîmes. You might have caused the town caught the town boundary sign there but you're still five kilometers to race as he goes under the banner that's the perfect time to hit the riders and the concentration has broken look at the way that man has moved away and it wasn't as if they didn't know Paul he was the most dangerous lone finisher in the group well there were three guys I figured had the ability to ride away to the finish alone Igor Gonzalez de Galliano was the man who started all of the aggression but what he did then was opened up the attacks for three or four kilometers but once that man got himself 100 meters, it was unbelievable. He's getting settled now into the zone, the individual time trial zone, which he took to victory in races like the Vuelta a España and, of course, in the Giro d'Italia. Now he's feeling confident. The pain is probably screaming through his body. He wants to stop, but he's actually lifted just a little bit by the fact that he's got the freedom that he's been waiting for. He hasn't won yet because when they begin to realize that they're going to lose anyway, then they will reorganize and individual 
individually attack one another. And here goes the first one, Igor Gonzalez de Galliano. Now he's another top time trial rider. They're going to have to chase him, otherwise they'll say goodbye to him as well. I can't believe the two riders from Uskatel Uskadi feel they're both together. They have the tactical advantage of having teammates in the group and they are not jumping onto these moves alternatively. They are losing the possibility of a stage victory on the flat as they did on the first few days in the flat stages and they've been blown away in the mountains but look at the pressure look at the speed and the pace Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano has not done anything for a couple of years but a couple of years ago he did wear the yellow jersey in the Tour de France yes he did and he finished I think it was fourth in the end but I'd need to check on that but right now Gonzalez de Galdiano has been nailed back there by Fedrigo the Frenchman on Credit Agricole, but this rider is now in a position to be able to settle into his speed, and we're looking at around about 12 seconds. So it just looks easy, doesn't it, the way he just sits there, but the reason it looks easy is because he's a very powerful rider, locked solid on his machine, ticking out a nice revolution. The team that's really missed out is the team with the orange jerseys, Uskatel Uskadi. When you've got two riders in a group, you have to be attentive. You have to say, you cover the first, I'll cover the second, and you have to cover every counter-attack that goes, and they've missed and failed on every occasion. Gonzalez and Piedic Fedrigo are the two riders trying to reach him. We're about to hit three kilometers to go for Aito Gonzalez. He's been allowed to settle in now. His heart is catching up with his legs. And now he is looking at a win here. And it will be an incredible result for him. Three Tours de France, no finishes. And in fact, he's never been in the race after stage 10. Here we are on stage 14 as he races now towards what would be victory number three for Fasa Bortolo. There, under three kilometers, Piedic Fedrigo attacks. Igor Gonzalez looks back and says, where are you? And the main man says, I'm going. And he's being chased by the rest of the line and having difficulty tagging onto the back here is Martinez. Well, Mongin went straight over the top. He must be feeling very frustrated. He's an excellent sprinter from a group like this and he would be thinking a few kilometers ago, this is ideal for me. I've got a big chance of getting myself the victory but they're going to actually have to work as a solid group if they want to pull this man back. Phil, he hasn't won a race so far this year, but this is a man who's got a very good talent for riding on his own. Look at Mongin, he's got the gap. Paul, that seems to be the recipe for winning stage of the Tour de France this year. Don't win before you come to the Tour, because so often that has happened this last 10 days. But now it's going to be counter-attack, and Nicolas Jalabert, who started it all, is trying to get across here to Christophe Manjon. If he does, he'll be a good workhorse, and he could take the sprinter towards Gon Gonzalez. I'm not sure he will now because he's caught up on the back wheel there with Mongin as Gonzalez goes under two kilometers to go. The gap is still at 12 seconds to two chases. Add on another five or six to the rest of the breakaway. Well, he's still riding nice and solidly. He's able to ride on his own and get into his own personal rhythm. The two Frenchmen now have got the gap that they want. There's the man that started the aggression, just trying to get across the gap. Nicolas Jalabert, joined there by Christophe Mongin. The French might just pull it back together. The man we're looking at here in, in the front of the bike race is riding an absolutely superb escape. You know, his last win was a time trial in the Giro d'Italia back in May last year, but earlier on in that season, he did get himself a road racing victory in the Reggio Calabria. Well, we've seen 10 men use each other for a couple of hours today, using all the drafting, slipping in, saving their energy, but now it is a total free-for-all. It is one-on-one, -on -one. do your bit when you get your breath back. They haven't any way of organizing this chase now. They all want to win, and the result is that this rider, who has that rare gifted talent of being able to race alone against the clock to reach speeds of 30 miles an hour and hold them, and all he's got to do is hold it for three miles or five kilometers. He's now running towards the finish. I think he can surprise himself and begin to smile now. He's coming into town at 33 miles an hour. He goes through the S's here. He now turns for the finishing straight. And this will be one of his greatest wins as a stage race rider because Igor Gonzalez has never won a stage, or Aitor Gonzalez, I beg your pardon, has never before been this far in the Tour de France. And he certainly before has never won a stage of it and he was such the obvious pick and nine top professionals could do nothing about it when he went and yet everybody must have known he would have only been able to win a stage of the Tour de France doing it this way
and now all he's got to do is sit up, enjoy the moment, wait to the crowd. There's no yellow jersey, he's far too far behind, but he can enjoy a victory in the Tour de France. And what a way to get it, to ride them all the way off your wheel, all nine of them. And now, just look back and watch who finishes second. Gonzalez takes the day. It'll be a battle royale for the sprint, and Christophe Monjean must surely be the favourite. He should be the favourite, but watch out for Nicolas Jalabert. He punches quite a big sprint as well there as he comes around the outside in the green shorts. They come up alongside the other Frenchman, and in fact, it's going to be Jalabert get the win here. He's the man who started the aggression, and he will kick himself this afternoon that he wasn't able to finish it off. There's a slight return there by Monjean, but it's not going to be the case. And the French there getting second, third, and fourth as Ferdiguero comes across the line there for fourth place just ahead of Peter Vrolik these men in the orange jerseys though Phil they really missed out this afternoon they had the tactical advantage of having two riders in the group and they must have known that Aitor Gonzalez was going to go out on a lone move like that and they did nothing no and in fact they took the last two places in the end the ninth and tenth of the breakaway that's not good this rider though a smile on his face the third stage victory for Fasa Bortolo and that's without the top sprinter Alessandro Bataki who didn't stay around too long in this year's Tour de France we'll take a break we haven't forgotten the peloton welcome back today's stage it's 14th day of the Tour de France a congratulations there to a man who rode the whole breakaway off his back wheel five kilometers not quite to go Aitor Gonzalez at last, uh, at last right, raising a smile there because he's been something of a disappointment since he joined Fasa Bortolo. But now all that is behind him. This is a magnificent attack. Everybody who knows Gonzalez would have expected him to do this. Uh, but he's got so much speed in those legs. He gets for him his first ever stage win in the Tour de France. So let's have a look then. We can give you the first 10 anyway in the stage results brought to us as usual by Pacific Life. Let's see uh, where they are. First is Aitor Gonzalez, 4 hours 18 minutes for 120 miles. That, believe me, is quick. Nicolas Jalabert coming in at uh, second best. He started the move 25 seconds behind. Uh, Christophe Mangin, 25 seconds. Then came Pierrick Fedrigo, all French. Then Peter Rolick of Austria in uh, the fifth place there. Mark Lutz of uh, Holland, he gets six at 31 seconds. Split timed everybody you see. They all split up on the chase. Santiago Botero got washed away. And the two boys from Uscatel finishing at dead last of that breakaway. And that's a surprise. When you have two men on the same team in the breakaway, at least one of them should be close to getting the win. Now, we haven't forgotten about the peloton. It is now five minutes and counting since uh, Gonzalez crossed the line. This is the peloton and they are still looking for the result. That is downtown Nîmes, and you might guess that it's well known by the Romans here many years ago, and they've left uh, plenty of memory in this beautiful area. Now, the peloton are lining up now because they're lining up for the big sprint for that green jersey. So we must keep an eye out for that. Anyway, we've got time to bring you now our Subaru moment, and that's uh, driven by what's inside. But now all that is down here the breakaway here this is how it started on the right of the road we knew it was going to come and he signaled virtually the attack but the, he went right to the wrong side of the road that was the move that broke the spirit they couldn't reach his slipstream quick enough and he was gone and once he settled in of course Aitor Gonzalez was clear and away there we are that's our Subaru moment driven by what's inside Meanwhile, back down the road, the peloton, and now six minutes has ticked by at the finish. Well, the, what we've got to do now, Paul, is follow the sprinters because this will be a battle royale. Watch out for the green jersey of Robbie McEwen, a pink jersey which will be owned by Eric Zabel, white and red, owned, of course, by Stuart O'Grady. And watch out for the flag of Norway because that's on the back of Tor Hushoft. This is the riders now of the Lotto team. Their idea is to try and bring forward Robin McEwen. Watch out for the rider in green. He's not far away. The winner's already home. We'll be back for the grand finish of the peloton. Don't go away. Looking now at the pacemakers here of the Lotto team as they now try to bring McEwen up to the finish. They're inside just four kilometers to go from the line. And the gap is uh, nine minutes since Aitor Gonzalez crossed the line, almost 10. 
Well, looking down the line there, the green jersey of McEwen is taking close order right up near the front. Uh, bet your life that Eric Zabel is lining up. We have seen Stuart O'Grady getting in the way as well. So the action is going to come from about 10 men down. This is a terrific sprint finish here. Once you're round that roundabout, it is a total free-for-all. Superb finish for the sprinters, uh, although that final bend inside of the last kilometre is a long sweeping, sweeping bend. It's around about 250 degrees around it from once they come into that roundabout, but then it does straighten up, and then it looks like a superb avenue to open up the sprint of around about 750 metres. It is a huge lead-out, though, by Team Lotto, trying to get their man in the green to the front. Hard work here by Lotto. It's now 10 minutes since Aitor Gonzalez crossed the line. The peloton bringing it to a close now, though. They're no longer in their slumber because this is a really free-for-all sprint. Robbie McEwen sits there, fourth man down. Eric Zabel is on his wheel, marking him. Behind him is Stuart O'Grady. Tor Hushoft is a little bit down at the moment. He's got those red shorts on, but he's moving up. He's a long way back, he's around about 15th there, but you never know, just around about to one kilometre to go, there's usually a moment in the main field where there's a pause and you can catapult up through the bunch by around about seven or eight places. That rider on the right-hand side is a lotto rider. His job done for the day, he's just going to sit up and ride into the finish, knowing that he's done a good job of work trying to set up the sprint for his leader. The other riders, too, now sitting up, not worried at all about their position on the stage, just happy that they've got in without being eliminated. And it's interesting to see that uh, Armstrong is centre of those blue jerseys, keeping out of trouble, so too is uh, Jan Ulrich, but dead centre there is Eric Zabel now. As uh, they try, this is Christophe Moreau here, trying as well to lead out Tor Hushoff, who all of a sudden is now riding in third place. He's in the red jersey because he's the champion of Norway. He is proving to be a very tough man in these sprints. Zabel also is moving up, and again, Robbie McEwen, he's such a small rider, he's out of vision. Well, Robbie McEwen doesn't really enjoy being led out by a train of riders like men as such as Alessandro Pataki and of course Mario Cipollini do he likes to find his way up through the bunch and looks for the gaps and bolts out at the last possible moment there's Tor Hushoff in the jersey there the white jersey with the blue and white cross on it champion of Norway being led out by his teammate Zabel on his shoulder not too far behind the red white and blue jersey of Stuart O'Grady being very attentive look at all these moves people coming round left and right trying to stay near the front but not wanting to come through until the last possible moment well McEwen just lost Kus and helped one of his lead out men with a flat tie he's already gone off at the back now but this is going to be a battle because on the right you've got uh, Rolf Aldag who's trying to lead out Eric Zabel this is the rear of the field which we're not very interested in right now as they go into the finish but back at the front is the main charge for the line now Zabel still perfectly positioned O'Grady is shaking his head there shouting at his teammate to come across the front his teammate comes in front of O'Grady now to try and lead him out I'm not sure after that effort he's got the legs to lead out O'Grady very difficult but O'Grady doesn't want to go to the front too soon if you get caught out too soon it leaves you a very long way to open up the sprint but it's again the team of Lotto Doma the team of Robin McEwen have got control over the front end of the main field Zabel is up into fourth place on the wheel of Stuart O'Grady round the big long roundabout it's very difficult here no touch of the brakes at all because if you do you will slip back down the main field McEwen a long way back but don't discount him because he can recover I tell you what Jan Ulrich's pretty close to the front as well well this is amazing this is like they are sprinting for the win but it's only for the points for the green jersey now as they start to break O'Grady is waiting he's still getting the lead out now O'Grady second wheel Zabel is jumping onto O'Grady's wheel still McEwen is on the shoulder there of Tor Hushoff now it's up to a lead out here for Zabel can Zabel get the points really McEwen cannot afford this as O'Grady falls away now the lead out is coming and it's going to be on the left of our picture and he should break now he kicks here comes Zabel and McEwen is now in third wheel as Tor Hushoff goes. Here comes Robbie McEwen. He is a magic sprinter when he goes. McEwen is coming to the line now and he hits it first. He gets it on the line. He is so fast. Where does he get his power from? There's nothing of him. Well, the thing about McEwen, he comes right up through the middle. He waits for the last possible moment. So the cheer you can hear just now is because the yellow jersey has crossed the line safely in the middle of that pack with Lance Armstrong, with Jan Ulrich and the rest. No change at all in the overall classification. But look at this sprint one more time those three men are in a straight line across the road but Robin McEwen almost from nowhere bolts out of the blue but look at that late comeback on the left hand side from Dalino Hondo that was very close indeed we need to see that again he might appear
pit Robbie but it's less important that Hondo pips him than Zabel or Hushoft and he's got the better of those two here's Cervez Canavan coming in in the centre and the rest of the race so these boys decided to sit up on the running life got a little bit too hot for them uh, they just come home now to live another day in the Tour de France they hope that their teammates have done the business up front uh, but I tell you what, that was an incredible finish, and they finished over 14 minutes behind today. But of course, all of the leaders of the Tour de France, after that brilliant two days in the Pyrenees, have finished alongside one well, another. Well, not all of the leaders, because there is the king of the mountains, Richard Viron, wins the sprint for about 97th place. And a smile on his face as he does it. It's not normal you see the riders sit up like this, which is an indication to us how hard it has been the previous two days. They've, uh, well, saved. they're only losing a bit of time that does no longer really matter to them. Uh, just, uh, there's Matthew Wilson, champion of Australia. And I think I've just seen Bobby Julik pass under as well. And Bobby is injured a little bit, but he's safely arrived at the rest day. And let's hope he gets better for when this race will resume on uh, Tuesday. And it's a tough old road to Villar de Lance, I can tell you that, up in the Vercourt. Oh, we can hear the conversation with Aito Gonzalez. He breaks out into smiles. But while he carries on with a conversation, I think we can have a look at the stage results. Let's have a look at the Pacific Life. There they are. Aito Gonzalez getting the win. Four hours 18 today is Jalaba, the man that started it, nearly finished it off. Christophe Manjon, probably the best sprinter. He gets third. Pedrigo fourth. Peter Rollick of Austria in fifth place. I think I said that he's German earlier in the commentary, but he's from Austria. Mark Lotz, uh, he's sixth. Igor Gonzalez de Galdiano. These are often meant for the overall classification, but today they've had to pick up uh, what was left in this year's Tour de France for many of them. Santiago Patero taking eight. Further down, this is what mattered for the green jersey. McEwen getting 11th over Hushoff. Hondo in the end looked closer than he was. He was two places back of McEwen. Stuart O'Grady and Eric Zabel. All of the sprinters involved in the green jersey claimed all of the places from the head of the bunch. Then come Yannick Tombak, Lorne Brochard, Sebastian Lang, Jerome Pino, and Rolf Aldag completing the top 20. The time gap for the peloton, 14 minutes and 12 seconds. As we look down on the Coliseum here in Nîmes, we'll take a short break and then we'll come back. It'll be prize presentation time and we'll see all of the jerseys on the eve of this rest day of the Tour de France. We'll take a break. Rejoin us. Well, every day is interesting in the Tour de France and this historic town has witnessed a great finish here in Nîmes. It was won by Aitor Gonzalez, a Spanish rider who lives probably just three hours down the coast because you go straight in towards Barcelona. Once you're south of Montpellier, here he is. He did what the Spanish riders could not do on the favourite terrain, the Pyrenees. He just rode away from a breakaway. It was an opportunist breakaway. It's had no effect on the destiny of the major prizes of the Tour de France. But these are the days you take your chance. And if it works out, you get your first victory in a Tour de France. And amazingly, the third for Fasa Bortolo. What a great sprint this turned out to be. You would have thought they were racing for first place. The top sprinters of the Tour, beaten again by Robin McEwen of Australia. And it was a good result for McEwen because Eric Zabel is pushed three places behind him. And that's three points gained for McEwen over him in that competition. Well, Gonzalez looks back. I don't suppose he saw many people there because he'd beaten most of them when he broke away some eight kilometers, five miles uh, from the finish. And like all good professionals, we saw Lance Armstrong do this straight in his jersey before he won yesterday now this man is getting ready for the celebrations as well 29 years of age and uh, very shortly i think as you can hear the crowd we can switch across there to see aitor gonzalez climbing onto the top step this man now phil has won a stage in the tour of italy the tour of spain and now finally won in the tour de france it's a great feeling and there aren't many can say that they've done that in the history of cycling he has had some wonderful moments he's won the tour of spain of course which he did a couple of years ago. And the crowd here have waited a long time to see the win across the line. They are now all smiled and applauding Aitor Gonzalez. We'll have a look at the Fosters' overall classification. Thomas Voigtler has brought this race to its second rest day as he did last Sunday. And he really deserves every accolade for that, but this time 
Lance Armstrong is now in second place, not sixth, and only 22 seconds off the lead. Mabasso, it seems, is his re-arrival now. Jan Ulrich goes to his rest there, massive seven minutes and one second down. And Sandy Casar, once third, is now sitting in tenth place. This has been an amazing couple of days in the Tour de France. Twice a Tour of Italy winner, Gilberto Simone sits 11th. He was so fed up, had no morale a week ago, said he was going home. Now he is riding in a very respectable position. And Levi Leipheimer, 14th, with 10 minutes down. While Oscar Sevilla becomes the leader of Fonac now in the absence of Tyler Hamilton. Don't forget, tomorrow is a rest day. We will have, of course, a rest day program for you. It is a recap program, and it will come to you at 9 p.m. Eastern time and the same time, Pacific time. And that will bring you all of the highlights so far in a Tour de France, which is building and building and building because it is going into the 